This is the Believe in Pro Wrestling Podcast. Here's Rick Uccino and SP3 on the Believe Podcast Network. And away we go on a Monday morning here on the Believe in Pro Wrestling Podcast, a special Juneteenth edition of the Believe in Pro Wrestling Podcast. So hopefully everybody's uh, enjoying a nice day. Everybody's had a great weekend coming off of Father's Day, SP3. Hope you had a good Father's Day weekend, good sir, over there. And uh, you, do they celebrate Father's Day in the UK? Is this, a, is this a United States thing or is this a global thing? I don't even know. I don't, I don't know about the UK holidays here, but happy Father's Day to everyone watching us from the United States or UK or wherever. And of course, uh, happy Juneteenth as well to everyone watching and listening to us on the Belief in Pro Wrestling podcast. Available here on the YouTube channel. Make sure to hammer the thumbs up. Make sure to hammer the uh, subscribe button if you're if you're new here and you like what you hear. Got a lot of heavy topics to to get into today. Probably going to be some screaming. I'm going to try to keep my emotion levels in check. Uh, we we do a live uh, SmackDown review show on another outlet, uh, Codename Redacted, and uh, it, it was hard for me to keep my emotions in check on Friday night after what we saw to close out SmackDown. Yes, we will be talking about the return of Brock Lesnar. And no, it wasn't the return of Brock Lesnar that got me heated. It's how they booked the return of Brock Lesnar that got me heated. We will dive into that as he is scheduled to face Roman Reigns again. Main event of SummerSlam already booked. Can't wait for it. Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar in a last man standing match. We will dive into that today. WWE SP3 believes reportedly that they could just, you know, replace clone, I believe was the word that they used. Sasha Banks, who has been released, is in the process of being released, is working on her release, not been 100% confirmed by either parties at this at this juncture at the time of this recording. The way that this week in pro wrestling has worked, we're recording this early Father's Day morning. By the time this comes out on Monday, hell, we could have had two other major stories break. We'll have to save that for our live Tuesday edition at 2.15 uh, here on the Believe in Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the boss and WWE's belief that they can just replace her here on the Believe in Pro Wrestling Podcast YouTube channel. We'll talk about uh, Jeff Hardy, some new information coming out about the uh, the triple threat ladder match that apparently was never supposed to be, but was still going to be. Again, more layers of that onion continues to be peeled back. And oh, by the way, it's Forbidden Door Week. We're finally here. This coming Sunday, we have a major historical pay-per-view. We're going to dive into that as well. And oh yeah, I think, uh, I think Vince McMahon, did some things this past Friday. I think he did some things. Uh, Might have made some headlines. And I don't just mean the Fightful Select Wrestling Observer headlines. I mean ESPN. I mean Fox Sports. I mean everybody. Washington Journal, uh, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, excuse me. Everywhere. Uh, Vince McMahon. CNN had Uncle Dave on. That's how big this story has gotten. But the question is, does it mean anything? We'll dive into all that coming up. But first things first, got to thank our partners over at Bet Online. They continue number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Get the latest odds uh, on news and developments in sports, including the NHL Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, that one might be over. Avalanche kicking some ass last night, but you can never count out the Lightning. They haven't been beaten in a postseason series in four years at this point uh major league baseball the latest uh fighting news it's all up there including early and early nfl uh futures as well for 2022 bet online has everything for you go on to the website or log on your mobile device today sign up receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit all you got to do is use our promo code believe to get that bonus that is b-l-e-a-v get that bonus get into action bet online where the game starts and sp3 we got to start obviously uh, with the major story that happened, the 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 shocking story that happened on Friday, very nonchalantly just put out there, just thrown up on the corporate website, and some people started picking up on it. The, these people who had to be like just hunting 
and just waiting for something to come out on the corporate website. It was like 7.30 in the morning on Friday uh, that the, uh, a release was just put out on WWE's corporate website that Vince McMahon was voluntarily stepping down as the CEO of WWE. And everybody uh, started losing their stuff. Uh, hell, even Get Up uh, on ESPN. They had a, a breaking uh, news banner and had Greeny talking about it for at least eight seconds anyway. Uh, that Vince McMahon was stepping down as the CEO of WWE. Everybody from ABC to CNBC picked this up. CNN picked this up. And then even later afterwards, on in the day, WWE finally sent out the massive release to everybody that Vince was going to be on SmackDown to address the WWE universe. And as Jake Trapper so eloquently put it on CNN, of course he is. Of course he was. Of course Vince McMahon was going to trot out in front of the WWE universe and say something regarding these uh, very serious uh, allegations, which aren't even really allegations at this point. It's all pretty much been confirmed by uh, his lawyers, WWE's lawyers and everything like that. But uh, we talked about the allegations ad nauseum on a previous episode. So let's just focus on the actual news that broke down SP3. Let's start with him stepping down as CEO. Does, um, this, this makes headlines, right? But does it mean anything? Does it mean a damn thing? No, because of who he chose to who they chose to replace him. It was pretty much the only decision they could have made, which was putting Stephanie McMahon in charge as interim CEO and chairwoman. But if someone with the last name McMahon is in charge, it's definitely Vince McMahon. He's pulling the strings. He's the puppeteer and everyone else is the puppets. And then him coming out to address the WWE universe uh, on Friday was just a power move. It was very, it was very obvious of that. It was a ratings ploy to spark ratings, which seems to have worked. The ratings were up for this week's SmackDown, according to their early projections. And it was also a power move to show everybody that I may have stepped down as CEO and chairman, but I'm still the one who's pulling all the strings. I'm still in charge here. I'm still the face of not only only WWE, but professional wrestling on a mainstream level in general to a lot of people, to stockholders, to shareholders. Vince McMahon is a symbol of professional wrestling going out of the doldrums of the dark arenas into the major basketball, uh, hockey arenas, to the stadiums for, you know, WrestleMania and all these big events. Vince McMahon is that symbol. So him stepping down could be seen as WWE looking a little bit weak, but he made he made this address in front of the WWE universe on SmackDown saying absolutely jack crap, nothing. He didn't say a damn thing. All he did was repeat the WWE signature. And most fans, when he's like, then now forever and most importantly together basically telling us that we're in this together if i'm going down you're all coming down with me hell no nah. everybody, everybody is doing the uncle phil like we <laughs> we <laughs> we like seriously oh man i i i commend Visek man for the the audacity of this man he there is no one on the face of the earth no one in the face of wrestling who has as much audacity than Visek man so i mean he he told us he told us ad nauseum in the 90s his catchphrase was the size of his grapefruits. And that's that's what this is. Vince McMahon walked out there on Friday Night SmackDown, unzipped his pants and dropped his grapefruits on the on the ring apron like he like like the Undertaker was retiring, dropping his hat in the middle of the ring. That's what Vince did. He just dropped his balls on the middle of the ring and said, come at me, bro. That's basically what this was. This was Vince saying, come at me, bro. Business as usual. We're moving forward. And that's all. It was all it was. He didn't have to say a damn thing. He just walked out there, did his little, the strut was a little pulled back than what we usually see out of him, but he might still be sore from that ass kick and he took it at WrestleMania. But anyway, so he, he, he just tra 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 on out there. Like you said, does the signature 
and acts like nothing is wrong, acts like nothing is going down. There's no headlines. No one's been talking about him all week. And that was the point. He wanted to show that nothing bothers him, that nothing is going to change, that nothing is going to matter in the grand scheme of things, whether he steps down as CEO or not. Which, by the way, you talk about it not mattering because of who they put in the chair. This doesn't matter because Vince has pretty much not been CEO for quite some time now. Most of the major operations inside a business, as far as WWE are concerned, are run by Nick Khan. Nick Khan has been the fall guy, has been the point guy for all of these massive releases. That, that doesn't mean he hasn't been CEO. He has been CEO. He has been the no, chairman. I get it, Nick Khan, Nick Khan is business. the president. Nick Khan is the president. So he does a lot of the president is going to do a lot of the business type of things. CEO is just a figurehead. Is this a figurehead CEO chairman? It's just a figurehead because he is the face of the organization. So as far as like business, you know, acquisitions and all that type of stuff, it's going to be done by Nick Khan. I think Stephanie in this role is basically doing what she was doing as chief brand officer. And yes. it's going to be more of that for her than doing anything that, you know, entails what the CEO and chairman does, which is nothing. Any CEO or chairman for a company, they are literally just the face of the company. And that's what Vince has been all along. So I can't, I, I would say that I disagree with the fact that he hasn't been CEO for a while because he's always been CEO. He's always been the face of this company. But as far as the business, the president is always going to do that. Regardless, this move is basically just a gesture. And it, the, the gesture pretty much is a giant middle finger up in the air. Like, that's what this gesture is. It's to just show that, oh, WWE is doing something, right? Oh, the board is investigating, which they are. They're investigating. And they're and that's, that's the big issue here because it still is a big issue. Because I'll, I'll see people talk about how, well, that's not a criminal investigation. Nothing really done was illegal. Yeah, in this instance. But how many of the other NDAs are they digging up that have alleged misconduct against both Vince and John Laurinaitis? John Laurinaitis was a, a ghost uh, on Friday. He was he was not there. And many people expect him, at least if you believe the reports, to be the big fall guy in this situation and to end up being uh, released from WWE. I think that'll happen sooner rather than later because I do agree with a lot of the people uh, who share that sentiment that are out there. But I mean, this is largely a, a gesture to get the headlines, to be on CNN, to have everybody out there talking about, okay, this is a big deal because Vince McMahon has stepped down from CEO when really it's, it's not that big of a deal because Vince's stranglehold on WWE is still there. He owns 80% of the voting shares. He owns a third of the shares overall, even though it's a publicly traded company. And he is still the main figurehead and the main guy in charge of WWE creative. So from that standpoint, this was his Wolf of Wall Street moment. This was him going out there and saying, I ain't going anywhere. The show goes on. F everybody. And let's roll with it. And it was no more evident than that by the way that SmackDown ended on Friday when F and Brock Lesnar shows up out of nowhere as the in case of emergency break glass opponent for Roman Reigns at SummerSlam again again getting heated try to calm down we're we're we're, we're going to get there but basically if anybody's wondering what this means jack shit that's exactly what this means with Vince McMahon stepping out as Jack and I'm not trying to overshadow it cuz this is a big deal for for Stephanie right she is now the CEO the chairwoman of world wrestling entertainment that is that is big for her this is a role that she has trained for 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 her entire life and hopefully this this means something for her in the long run and if you listen to people like sean rossap and and any of the other insiders she is very very well liked within the company and everybody is very happy for her but what this is going to mean in the long run i don't know because people are sitting here saying that this is this is the biggest threat to vince's power in wwe since the steroid scandal but with him owning 80% of the voting shares, I don't know what the board can do, even if they do dig up some really heinous stuff, which might not be that, <laughs> that hard if you believe Vince's reputation. I don't know at this I point. I mean, if you believe everything that we've been told for the past 50 years or so. It um, shouldn't be hard to find something, yeah, right? It should, 
going to be hard to find. I think the most telling thing of all of this is in the release was Vince's statement that he's open to whatever the the board finds out and whatever consequences. So, like you said, uh, you know, it's still going to be Vince pulling the strings, but I think this move was made for a reason, and his statement is telling that if they do find something damning and they want to remove him from CEO or chairman – this is basically going to make it a, a smooth transition where they will remove the interim in front of Stephanie McMahon's name and she will just be CEO and chair and chairwoman. It's, it's whether or not they basically find something and then remove Vince from creative, will we see some type of real impact coming out of this? Right. And that, again, is the, the, the most impact. Because, again, from a day-to-day operations for, for for WWE. Nothing has changed, although the argument can definitely be made that it should. So let's dive into that, shall we? It's time to answer the five count on the Believe Podcast Network. So all eyes were on Vince McMahon at the start of Friday Night SmackDown. He came out, dropped his fruits, basically said nothing. And yes, by the way, I know there were a lot of people in that crowd who were chanting along and singing along and 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 singing Vince's praises. Just keep in mind, by the way, you would not be surprised how many people in that audience had no idea what the hell was going on. There are people who don't watch the news, who aren't on Twitter, who have no idea what the hell is going on, and we're probably just singing like, oh, hell, it's Vince McMahon. Yeah, this is a great thing to start off the show with, and are praising the, the figurehead more than anything. Um, and I think that's what Vince wanted. I think that's part of what Vince wanted. He wanted to get that big reception. There was a chorus of boos. I definitely think that uh, the the sound was sweetened by the truck uh, to, to make that uh, a, a little bit of a bigger pop for him. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to jump on those fans who were, who were cheering for Vince because I'm willing to bet there's a large portion of them who had no idea what the hell was going on. Oh, oh, don't worry. I will. You suck. You suck. <laughs> if you put your head in the sand and try to avoid the real world by not reading Twitter, by not paying attention to all the headlines that are out there, I'm someone that – I can look at it from a perspective of down the middle because Vince has done stuff for my family itself that I cannot, you know, you know, damn him for. But if you're going to if you're going to praise him when he comes out after the scandal has been revealed, you are a dummy and you need to pull your head out of the sand. I'll be the one to say it here. All right. Fair enough. But all eyes on Vince at the start of the show. And now I'm, I'm going to scream at Vince for the end of the show. Because at the end of the show, we got a fantastic main event. Roman Reigns' first WWE, Universal, whatever the hell they're calling it, title defense since WrestleMania where he beat Brock Lesnar to win both belts. So we've waited two months for his first title defense, and it was a fantastic main event, a great showing for Riddle. A showing that probably should have been on the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, but I digress. They, they give Riddle this match. They close out. The storyline uh, with him and 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 Randy Orton, uh, unfortunately, you know that's another big news story that's kind of been lost in the in the shuffle for everything. Forgot to even put it in the damn rundown is the fact that he might miss the rest of 2022 with his back injury. Uh, Matt Riddle kind of basically confirming the reports that he does need a back surgery. Uh, so the concerns are he's going to miss most of 2022. So with Orton now out, with Cody Rhodes out for the rest of 2022, WWE was left to go. Well, shit. Who are we going to have Roman Reigns face at SummerSlam? Well, they put in a call to Saskatchewan. They found Brock Lesnar out in the middle of nowhere fighting a grizzly bear or some shit and said, hey, can you drive down to Minnesota? We need you on Friday. We need you to F5 Brock, uh, Roman Reigns, and there's another million-dollar paycheck in it for you. Probably. And he was like, all right. Yeah, let me let me wash up. I'll be on down. No big deal. No problem. He shows up on Friday after Roman Reigns defeats Matt Riddle. Again, fantastic main event. Great showing for Riddle, but we all knew he was going to lose anyway. It was always coming down to what was next. So Vince McMahon, in charge of creative, decides to call up Brock Lesnar again to be the to be the opponent for Roman Reigns. And I hear this argument all the damn time. Oh. Well, 
well, who else was he going to face? Who, who else was he possibly going to face? They, there's no challengers left. They don't have anybody. Whose fault is that? It's WWE's. They have the talent. They have booked themselves into this hole. And I will still make an argument that there are other people that made more sense that I would have been more excited for than Brock Lesnar again. We'll get to that part. But when Brock Lesnar came out last night, to me, it was never more evident that Vince McMahon needs to step down as the head of creative for WWE. This is a rhetorical question for me. And this, this is probably something that we could have talked about years ago at this point because the product is, has continuously gotten stale. They have continuously misused people. Big stars. You've said it before. They could get smacked in the face with a damn star and would have no idea what the hell to do with it. You can be handed stars, but it doesn't mean you know how to create success, to, be, to create a winner with them. That's why I appreciate Steve Kerr as the, as the head coach of Golden State. He can have stars, but he knows how to win with them. Vince McMahon doesn't know how to win with stars anymore. He doesn't know what to do with them. He is lost. He is outdated. He doesn't know what today's fans want, and I don't think he cares what today's fans want because he thinks he knows better than them still in 2022. And he has no idea what to do when things go wrong, so he just goes to his safe place. And his safe place is once again Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns. And my eyes could not have rolled further in the back of my head when Brock Lesnar's music hit. Again! Again! We are getting Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. Their five-year feud, which wasn't bad. Like, I'm not saying this rivalry is not one of, the, one of the best ones we've seen in the last decade or so. It's not a bad rivalry. It's had some things go its way, largely Vince McMahon, go against this rivalry that's going to make it from being any bigger than it should have been. But this was supposed to culminate at WrestleMania. This Vince finally got what he wanted. He got Roman over Brock at WrestleMania. That's what he wanted. And then we were going to move on. And now one challenger later, we're back to Brock Lesnar. Again, what's the story? What are you possibly going to do? Are you going to have Paul Heyman switch sides again? What's, what's, there's nothing left. There is no meat on this bone whatsoever. But this is what, this, this is what WWE does. We will, we'll play the safe move. People will pop because it's Brock Lesnar and because they're dumb and they don't know any better. Oh, it's Brock Lesnar again. Yeah, this is fucking great. I don't care that Brock Lesnar's back in WWE. Keep him away from the goddamn title picture. We've seen it. Do something different. Do something that's actually going to get the hardcore audience excited. Because you know what I, my plans already right now are? To leave SummerSlam early to beat traffic. Because I have no interest in watching this match. None. Their last match at WrestleMania was probably the 14th best match on the entire card. I wouldn't say that. It was one of the better ones on night two. Night two was not not as good as night one. Um, yeah, of course, of course, the answer to this question is yeah, it's time for Vince McMahon to step down as head of creative. But I can understand your frustration, but uh, I'm like numb to this because <laughs> 10, 12 years ago, I had to experience something else like this. Therefore, I can't tell the difference between this and this <laughs> this and this we've lived through this ladies and gentlemen we've lived through this 12 years ago where they would give us john cena versus randy orton at nauseum over they had their first over. match in 2007 the feud spanned until 2013 and then they had more matches in 2014. Like, this Brock and Roman, this will be the seventh time they have gone one-on-one -on -one at a pay-per-view. This will be the ninth time they've been in 
any type of uh, matchup, three-way, four-way singles matches on a pay-per-view. Yeah, it, it's definitely time to move on. And the fact that Roman Reigns says, um, hey, there's no one left. And we literally get the same person who we beat at WrestleMania. It's just like it, they have no self-awareness at this point anymore. They feel like this is the biggest possible matchup they can when they have people. They have Bobby Lashley, who would have made a, an excellent opponent for, it, for Roman Reigns. This is a matchup that they've only done once once one-on-one they've only done it they've only been in the ring t- pretty much twice because they were in a three-way la- last year for no reason at all um on an episode of monday night raw they've only been in the ring twice so at least there isn't there isn't you know that much wear and tear on that matchup Seth Rollins, Seth freaking Rollins is the only guy that has beaten Roman Reigns in the past two years. Yes, it was right disqualification, but you would assume WWE did that for a reason that it wasn't just, you know, a DQ finish to not follow up on it. And this would have been a perfect opportunity to follow up on it. And me and Rick, we, we talked about this ad nauseum that Seth should have just shown respect to Cody and turned babyface after Hell in a Cell because there's really nothing else for him to do as a heel character except for the same thing that I see everybody wanting. Oh, you know, it's Brock versus Roman, so let's do Seth Rollins winning money in the bank and cash in again. I will save this like I said it on Redacted, like I said it on True Hill Heat. WWE has proven Mm -hmm. themselves to be incapable of doing something great twice. So if you were asking for them to meet the quality of the first time Seth Rollins did this, I un- I'm i going to let you know you're setting yourself up for disappointment. There are much better options to win money in the bank. Case in point, the guy that I wish they would have set up for a matchup because he looked so great in defeat on Friday, Riddle, since he can't get a shot at Roman anymore, the perfect thing for him to do is win money in the bank so he could get another yeah. shot at Roman. That's the only way he can break this stipulation is by winning money in the bank. So he's a better option than Seth Rollins. Rick did a whole video, the fast count. Sami Zayn is a better option to win the money in the bank. I gave you a great argument for Kevin Owens. Repay him for all the work he's done. He's a better option to win money in the bank. You are axing, you basically, the people that are mad about Roman and Brock, yet are axing for the same thing that happened in the first Roman and Brock match, you are basically a hypocrite. Because but, you're but complaining, that, but that is no, how no, 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 desperate. But that's but, how desperate people are for something other than they are hypocrites. They're asking for something they, they've already seen as well. They exactly that's hypocritical. That's you can't criticize WWE for giving you something you've seen before and asking for something you've seen before <laughs> again. That is hypocritical. That is the definition of hypocritical. Let's get let's do something new for God's sakes. Let's do something new. <laughs> And did you know I'm desperate for something new when I'm agreeing with Rick? Sami Zayn has a great story for not only Roman, but also Brock. The other time he got a shot at the Universal title, it was Brock Lesnar that cost him. So he's the perfect if you want to do this again, but you don't, you, you want to make it different and not the same thing you saw seven years ago, have Sami Zayn be the one in the Seth Rollins position and cash in money in the bank. Why the hell not? But, oh, it's just like... And that that rolls perfectly right into the next question. All right, so you don't want it to be Brock. All right, well, come on, smart Mark fantasy booker. Come up with something better. That leads perfect into what I think should have happened. Seth Rollins should be the opponent for Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. He Summer hands Slam. or SummerSlam, excuse me, hands down should be the opponent for Roman. That should have been an obvious go-to. For if if you knew Orton was going to be out of action for a little bit, and you knew that there was a chance that he was going to miss SummerSlam. Okay, you needed a backup with Cody Allen. There's no reason that Rollins should have attacked Cody Rhodes because WWE, in their mind, is already thinking. 
nine months down the road and are saying, well, all right, well, we can have Cody come back and and beat Rollins at, at WrestleMania next year. So we'll set up that big matchup, Cody Rollins four at WrestleMania, when you don't need to because Cody has swept the series. It's done. It ain't a best of seven. It was a best of five, and it's over. Cody swept it. It's done. You're finished. There's no. There's nothing left. You could have actually added some some elements and some layers to Seth Rollins' character by not having him be a total dick. But no, you made him a total dick instead of turning him babyface, which was the obvious move, instead of pulling Edge from uh, the Judgment Day and making him your top babyface on Raw. At least we think that there's some correlation going on there. It should have been Rollins. He should have been the guy who got the, 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 the matchup at SummerSlam. And you could have set it up at Money in the Bank by using the Usos and Sami Zayn. That's what you could have done because you could have completed the babyface turn by having Seth Rollins in the Money in the Bank ladder match, which he already is in. And then you have him get screwed over in the Money in the Bank ladder match by the Usos who helped Sami Zayn win the briefcase because Zayn wants to win it to squash it, to prove himself to the bloodline by sitting on the briefcase and letting the contract expire, making sure nobody cashes in on Roman Reigns. That should be Sammy's arc heading into Money in the Bank, and the Usos should screw over Seth Rollins, allow Sammy to win the briefcase, and then Rollins has a case to challenge Roman at, at SummerSlam. That's how you set up the match. And then you have four weeks to, to finish out the storyline with Sami Zayn where he's constantly trying to prove himself to the bloodline, but he's never gonna because he's never going to be good enough no matter what he does. You do some kind of an angle where he make where this becomes the realization where maybe he's embarrassed to hell by the bloodline. You get some some sympathy behind Sami Zayn, and then you complete the, the babyface turn for Sami where he comes down and pulls the Rollins by cashing in. And hell, you can even have him beat Seth Rollins if you wanted to, to protect Roman Reigns, to keep him unpinned for this big matchup with the Rock at WrestleMania next year. That's that's a much better storyline. Does it completely make sense? Are there some holes in the sequences? Yes, there is. But it's better than just having fucking Brock Lesnar show up, give us one F5 on a Friday in June, and then you put out on social media... Uh, well, last man standing match at SummerSlam. We're done. That's all we got to do. Our work, our work here is done. <laughs> nice day of work. Um, you had, you were, I was with you 100% of the way until you rushed the Sami Zayn mark. It don't say that's something that they could, they can do months, months of story. Yes, they can. Is helping, is helping Roman win matches like against Drew McIntyre at Clash of the Castle. He could come in with the rough and hit him, about and hit him, hit, hit Drew with the briefcase. And then you can have Sammy in the middle of the ring after Drew. He hits Drew with the briefcase after Drew hits the Claymore. And you can have the fans be like, cash in, cash in. And you can have that, that Kangman Adam Page looking at the A. W World Championship is that Sammy's looking at the money in the bank like should I should I should I and then he doesn't like you can draw that out for a long time don't do it Fair over point. four yeah. weeks okay, especially fine. when you just turn uh, Seth Rollins baby face but I 100% agree with you Seth Rollins was the slam dunk because the, the story is already there this is the only person that Roman Reigns has faced in the past three years in the past two years that he hasn't beaten he hasn't beaten him. And the whole story going into the Royal Rumble is how Seth has a better record against Roman than Roman has against him. Every time they burst on a big time stage, Seth wins. So the story writes itself. It was so simple. So simple. I've heard people in Bobby Lashley, Bobby, like I said before, Bobby Lashley, he's already been built up. Why does he care about theory and the United States championship? Why does he care about Paul's downs? He should want because the title that he got screwed out of. He never again, lost the WWE title. Again, it goes back to WWE. And this is why the answer to this first question is rhetorical. Because shit like this wouldn't happen. They tease Bobby Lashley going after the WWE championship one night. And then the next night he's going after the United States title. Because Austin Theory came down to talk shit. And then he's the one that backs away. 
this is the kind of stuff they do over and over and over again. And yes, by the way, the other thing we didn't talk about for obvious reasons for everything that, that has gone on behind the scenes, Vince should be stepping away from WWE in a permanent role. All right. I think we glossed over that, but putting all the controversy aside, Vince is bad at his job. He's bad at his job. He changes his mind constantly. He gets he he gets impatient with people. He he throws half-ass ideas out on the screen before he's got a full concept of what he wants, and then it drags out and ends up meaning nothing. Look at Rowan and the Spider, and now look at Maximum Male Models. It is not any more evident that they have no clue what they want to do, which is a disservice to Max Dupree, a.k.a. Eli Drake, a.k.a. L.A. Knight. The guy's too damn talented for you to go, oh, we'll give you this. But we have no idea what the hell we're going to do with it. Let's just get you on screen because we don't have time to figure it out because we don't care. Because we don't care. Because unless your name is Brock or Roman, we don't care. And you just took a good idea and you made it better. It it should be Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. And yes, I rushed the whole cash in idea. All right, I rushed the whole cash But that doesn't mean that Sammy can't screw Rollins out of the match at SummerSlam. That doesn't mean, like you said, that Sammy can't screw Drew McIntyre out of the win in Cardiff. And, you know, you can then have Sam. Well, Sammy's already feuded with uh, with Drew, so you kind of have already burnt that. But you can still have Drew whoop Sammy's ass. You could still send yeah, Sammy to the ringer. Sammy Zayn is a perfect money in the bank holder because they love to job the money in the bank holder a thousand and one times before they cash in. So Sammy could be screwing all of Roman's challengers, and then their challengers can get their heat back by beating Sammy afterwards. Yes. I think at the end of the day, you know, if, if WWE wants to, to get to their ultimate goal of having Rock and Roman, you know, I think you, you can get the title off of him by putting it by putting it on Sammy, whether he cashes in in a triple threat match or not. Again, that, that would be very simple for Sammy to pin Roman's opponent to take the title away to protect him. Doesn't matter who it is, uh, you know, if it's at survivor series or if it's at day one or if it's at the royal rumble if you stretch it out all the way there there's plenty that you could do with sammy in that role and maybe they'll ultimately do that you know he has he has a, a qualifying match this for, coming friday against shinsuke nakamura i don't have any faith that they'll put shinsuke in the damn match i think sammy makes a ton of sense and i hope that this is a story that they adapt because i think it is a good story but yes you're absolutely right don't rush it don't rush it. I went on a diatribe. I didn't think things out full in its advance, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't still be Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. And Sammy can cost him. And then guess what? You could do a Rollins and Sami Zayn feud, which would be really, really fun. That would actually be fun, and those matches would bang. And guess what? You could actually book Seth Rollins to win some damn matches that he hasn't been winning, except over AJ Styles in a qualifying match, which AJ Styles would be a better opponent at SummerSlam. And I've had people who sit here and tell me, but but he just lost to Rollins. It doesn't make any sense for him to now challenge Roman Reigns at SummerSlam. Don't book him to lose to Rollins in a freaking qualifying match. Again, it's all WWE fucking. Don't book AJ Styles to lose every single match he's had since WrestleMania, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> yes. WWE has booked themselves into this situation, and then people are like, well, there's nobody left. What do you expect them to do? <sighs> As if my frustrations couldn't be any more higher. We have the whole Sasha Banks situation that's going on right now. Is she released? Is she not released? Is she in the process of being released? There's one thing we know for sure. Sasha Banks is not coming back to WWE anytime soon. And now we've kind of gotten a, a spotlight, right, into the thought process of WWE creative, which, again, I go back to question one, rhetorical. Andrew Zarian of MattMen.com, or excuse me, the MattMen podcast and the Wrestling Observer. WWE, this is how they view Sasha Banks. They feel that they can replace or that they can clone Sasha Banks. They don't need Sasha Banks, the person. They don't need Mercedes. They just need somebody in the Sasha Banks role. We've seen this before, by the way. We've seen this before dating back all the way to the 90s. That they think that, oh, we're stupid. That they can just put somebody else in this role. Hell, we've seen this very recently with Alexa Bliss and Bray Wyatt. They think that we're stupid. That they can just take the character or the role or the gimmick and just move from one person to the next and they'll be as successful and as loved. No, as a matter of fact, Alexa Bliss got freaking hate emails and hate tweets and harassed for stealing Bray Wyatt's gimmick when it was given to her by WWE Creative. 
because they feel they can do this shit. I'm very angry today, if you can tell. I'm usually not this. A lot of frustrations this week for me. SB3, is this arrogance or stupidity? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I've been using the word hubris, which <laughs> is an excessive amount of self-confidence in their, in, a, in their selves. And that's WWE for you. They have, they just have the, and I said it about Vince, the unmitigated audacity to believe that they can replace Sasha Banks. The best, and I said it once, I'll say it again, the best in-ring female performer that this company has ever seen, has ever seen. This woman has put on some of the best matches that this company has seen. She has crossed over and become a mainstream star, uh, you know, starring on The Mandalorian, her connection with Snoop Dogg. Like, they have so many things that they never capitalized, and they just never saw Sasha Banks as the crossover superstar that we all thought that we all saw that she could be, and they never reached that potential with her. So, of course, they believe they can replace Sasha Banks because they never got Sasha Banks to the point where she could be. So if they can get, if they can basically keep someone who can be a mainstream star here instead of getting them over here out the screen, <laughs> then of course they're going to believe that they can get someone who, whose talents is not there like Sasha Banks and their talents are here. They believe that they can get them to that, that glass ceiling that they created of here. So it is what it is, whether it's, you know, someone who is very talented, like Bianca Belair, whether it's someone who has a lot of athletic background and charisma, but just isn't, you know, there as an in-ring performer on NXT 2.0, like Lash Legend. They believe that they can clone and replace Sasha Banks. So it is a little bit of both. It is arrogance and stupidity, but more so I lean toward ar arrogance. I'm leaning more toward stupidity uh, on this because they will be, you know, if you, if you look at the reports, their mindset on this, the, the mental gymnastics that they are, that they are going out of their way to do on this is to say, well, Sasha Banks has never been that big of a deal. You know, she's she's not at the same level of a, a Charlotte or a Becky or a Ronda. She's not she's not worthy of that top level booking. Hell, she's not even worthy enough for us to promote the fact that she's an effing Star Wars. All right. Not worthy of that. Right. They made more mentions of Star Wars on May 4th than they did of Sasha Banks actually being in Star Wars. Did not make a big deal about that at all. They have never made Sasha Banks out to be. A, a big deal. And you've said this before. The only reason why Bianca and Sasha were even in the main event of WrestleMania is because they had like no other options that year. Let's not act like that feud was great because they built most of it around Reggie's dumbass. So like, and at this point, I don't even remember how that made sense. Like I don't, I don't remember how he jumped from Carmella to Bianca. And I don't, I don't remember that because it was so, so, so stupid. They had never uh, Sasha, Sasha beat him up, so he started simping for Sasha. Oh, and that's okay. how he got involved with uh Sasha and uh Bianca. Okay, all right. The fact that Sasha was able to do as much great things, as much first, as, as shatter as many glass ceilings that she did is absolutely remarkable. Yet, WWE, if you believe the report's creative, they don't view Sasha in that light yet, yet they see her big enough to find the need to clone her, to take over that role, to replace her with somebody else. They find her to be that big enough that they feel the need to do that, but they don't think highly enough of her to actually keep her around and book her as a man. What? This makes no sense. The mental gymnastics on this is physically impossible it defies the law of physics the way you're trying to bend and mold around this if you had just booked sasha banks like sasha banks the star is is deserving of her booking and yeah i know she's a seven eight time women's champion but damn man 
You put the tag team titles on her, and the straw that broke the camel's back was you going to job her out to, to Ronda Rousey on a pay-per-view y'all didn't care about. <sighs> I'm going with stupidity because this is all stupid. It's all stupid. Yes, it's both, but it's stupid. In a week where there have been God knows how many huge stories uh we've kind of forgotten about jeff hardy who was the the lead story for all of about eight minutes this week uh we've had some some new information come to light on how wwe was planning or excuse me aew uh was planning on booking their big triple threat tag team ladder match for the uh for the world titles on wednesday a lot of questions surrounding jeff hardy and his his health his physical health his his mental health obviously with suffering a uh concussion or getting uh, at least his brain stove in in that uh, that pay per view match with the Young Bucks. Wondering how you would book this match if he was not going to be ready to compete. Well, apparently, um, it was first reported by the Wrestling Observer that the Hardys were never supposed to be in the match. It has now been reported by Sean Ross at Fightful.com that Jeff Hardy was the one who was not going to be in the match. They were still going to book Matt to be in there. They were going to take Jeff Hardy out pre match. So at least that shine some light on what AEW kind of knew what was going on with Jeff Hardy and they wanted to book this huge match and they were going to do an injury kind of angle where Hardy gets taken out prehand and now it's it's Matt left to fight for the tag team titles by themselves by himself ultimately it was going to end up with the same result anyway the young bucks are now uh the AEW world tag team champions but there's been a lot of talk about Jeff and and how he how he is um Matt Hardy and his wife have kind of shined a light on on what it's like you know with Jeff out on the road and you know what they did that night a lot of people accusing them of, of being enablers and asking where the hell were they even i kind of asked couldn't jeff have just called his brother for a ride because that's always been my biggest thing i'm never going to i'm never going to judge anybody on their demons because we all have them we all have our struggles i've gone through them myself you know i've, I've been very open about uh, a lot of those on this program we all have our issues, so I'm not going to judge jeff for that but again getting a ride that seemed to be a big thing but matt wasn't even in town at that point matt had dropped him off at jeff's hotel room and then went and caught a flight like this he made sure that he got back to his hotel room safely and then jeff being the adult that he is went out and left and made some very terrible decisions and these are decisions that he has made before and it raises you know a serious serious question is whether or not this lifestyle this on the road lifestyle even in a company like aew where the travel is not as extensive is this the right lifestyle for him? And ultimately, he's the one that's going to make that decision. But, I mean, it, it it begs to be asked, should Jeff Hardy return to AEW following this latest incident, whether he gets clean or not? Um, Should Jeff Hardy return following this whole arrest? No, he shouldn't. I don't think the lifestyle is good enough for him. Is- is good for his mental state and where he's at with his addiction. I think that is in a lot of people's eyes, it's just another reason to, you know, drink and do the drugs that he's doing because of his in ring style that necessitates him taking these big risks. So I, I think that the best decision for him is to get away, whether that's permanently or whether that's for a while. I don't really know because you can also say, you know, he should never return to wrestling again. And that gives him too much downtime and further he's going to go yeah. down that, that, that downward spiral again. But I think that he needs like a year to two years of just getting his life right proving that he can be sober for that long and just being away from this environment and especially with aew where i've seen firsthand they have a very much of a party environment and a party you know atmosphere where the owner is getting bottles of liquor from behind the bar and getting shots for performers like that's not where jeff needs to be It, again, it's it's a very difficult thing because I'm I'm never going to be one to tell, try to get in the mind of somebody or uh, get into the mind of people who are around somebody and tell them what is what is best for them. I can only look at this as an outside outside observer, and you know, again, hard to get into motivations and things. But I do I I do find it very 
not hard to connect the dots when you look at the match that Jeff had with Darby and how banged up and bruised and and just injured he came out of that. And you know, he the he gets to AEW man and he's going full full bore. He like his second or third match or whatever it was, he's jumping off the top of a roof through a table onto a concrete floor at like 45 years old after decades of doing stuff like this and it's like WWE was not using him in that way. So he went from like just coasting along and catering and chasing the 24 seven championship to, Oh damn, man, I'm Jeff Hardy. I'm going to jump through. Uh, I'm invincible. I'm going to jump through this and everything's going to be fine. That match with Darby screwed him up. And you know, all of a sudden now, like he's, he's drinking on the road and there's, there's video of him drinking at, you know, fan signings and this, that, and the other thing he's out in public, just openly drinking. And, um, you know, I do believe there were, there were drugs in his system as well. So it's, it's no, it's not a big leap for me to judge by the fact that the worse he feels physically, the more he ingests to try to numb that. So if he does come back after, like you said, getting, getting, getting clean, getting right, getting smart, he's got to change his style up for sure. If he comes back, he can't continue to be that. Oh, I'm Jeff Hardy. It's it's dynamite. They expect me to to jump through a table, so I'm going to do that. That's that's where Tony and Matt and everybody really kind of need to to restrain and pull him in. You want him to do those kind of spots? Save it for a pay per view. Save it for a big money event. All right, we all love Jeff Hardy, and that's the thing. Everybody loves Jeff Hardy. They want the best for Jeff Hardy. That includes us accepting that Jeff Hardy shouldn't be the Jeff Hardy of old at this point. So let's not all expect him to come back on his first night whenever he's back and to be Jeff Hardy and take some kind of wicked flipping bump onto the corner of some steel steps. All right. We we don't need to see that from Jeff Hardy anymore. But first things first, he needs to get uh, himself right. And I think uh, people also, you know, when it comes to, to Matt and those closest around Jeff need to not rush to judgment uh, as well. Let's talk about something fun uh, for the first time on this show today, shall we? It is a pay-per-view week. Forbidden Door is this uh, coming Sunday live in Chicago, Illinois. because That's where AEW loves to put all their big shows is in Chicago, apparently. But we got another big matchup that has been set. FTR, they are going to uh, probably take all the gold at some point this year. So they're getting their shot to take the IWGP tag team titles. Um, you would know this better than than I would. Again, I'm not the, the New Japan guy. Um, but... Apparently, there are some heavy hitters that are missing from New Japan on this card so far, Okada being one of them. Um, people expecting a little bit more talent from New Japan to end up on this card. So I'll ask you, SP3, what is a match that you would like to see added to Forbidden Door? Uh, it's the one match that they built to, and they haven't you know, really done anything for it on Dynamite. They did a little bit of chatter about it on Rampage this past week, but it's a matchup with... Zack Saber Jr. versus the American Dragon Brian Danielson, the two best technical wrestlers in the world, going at it, and that's the type of match that makes the whole Forbidden Door card seem that much better. Because Moxley and Tadahashi, they're gonna deliver what they what they're gonna deliver. Thunder Rosa versus Tony Storm, that should be fa fabulous in, in every way possible. Two of the best women's wrestlers in the world going at it in front of a sold out crowd whatever they decide to do with jay white whether it's jay white versus hangman adam page jay white versus adam cole and hangman adam page or a four-way if okada decides you know i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna risk going to america and coming back in time for my wife's birthday if he decides to do that then yes i would love that that four-way Okada involved as well, or if it's something with Tensuyo Naito or Shingo Takagi or Hiromu Takahashi, there is a lot of big names that are missing, but the one match that they have done stuff for over on New Japan is Zack Sabre Jr. teasing, going after Brian Danielson. These guys can deliver. I just am hopeful that Brian Danielson will be medically cleared to do no. this match, and hopefully they can set that up on this week's Dynamite, so that's the match that I most want to see. And I also want to say, people are going to be surprised how good Will Ospreay versus Orange Cassidy is going to be. People are sleeping on that matchup, but I guarantee you it's going to be just as good as Pac versus Orange Cassidy was at Revolution 2020. All right, there we go. Um, 
like I said, I'm I'm just not um, knowledgeable enough to sit here and say which New Japan Pro Wrestling star should should be on the card. So I'll take kind of a cop out here. Uh, I'm going to say Jade Cargill and Athena for the TBS championship. I would add that match to the Forbidden Door card. You have six matches right now. Uh, might get up to seven. This is a relatively light card uh, for an AEW event when we were coming off of Double or Nothing, which was 14 matches, I, I believe it was, and was a, a five and a half hour uh, spectacle. So this is this is a roughly light card. I think this is something that they have been building to, and they have been building well towards it. And yeah, I think I would like to see uh, Jade Cardgill and Athena uh, get put on this big spotlight. I think it's gotten a big enough build that it, it deserves a, a pay-per-view shot. Uh, and then you can move to Statlander and Jade Cargill down the line uh, at another point. So I think that's the one I'd like to see. I hope Brian Danielson is is good to go because I do think that's a match they want to put on. But I did hear Sean Ross have talk about there is at least some belief that Brian suffered a concussion. And with his history, that is an issue. Uh, so they got to make sure they, they they get things right with him. But the fact that they've actually continued to tease this, they must feel good. Uh, that they got a shot to, to put it on. Regardless, uh, this is going to be a, a, a good pay-per-view, and we are going to talk all about it this week. I forgot to grab the graphic beforehand, so uh, I'll just make the announcement here. We are going to be doing our Forbidden Door prediction show this coming Friday. It'll drop 7 a.m. available in the morning here on the Believe in Pro Wrestling YouTube channel and wherever podcasts are available, whether it's iHots, iHeart, iHot. I went Boston there for a second. iHot, iHot, the iHot radio app. I don't know what that was. That wasn't Boston. Anyway, so we got all of that. Uh, Spotify, Apple, we're available everywhere. Uh, Nick Hausman from uh, Wrestling Inc. is going to join us this Friday, 7 a.m. We're going to break down the entire card, and we're going to see if he believes that he can beat SP3 in a trivia challenge. I mean, come on, man. I got to come up with, like, New Japan questions. Like, this should be a cakewalk for you, right? Like, you're the, you're the New Japan guy. You're the master. You got this. You're on a winning streak. You're going to figure out some way to screw me. I already know this. I've I've been trying. My best efforts have not been fruitful. Uh, as of late, you started off 0-2. You've won five in a row. It's ridiculous. Because I'm that damn good. Uh, by the way, I know I didn't make the uh, announcement that our Money in the Bank prediction show would be with Ryan Satin of Fox Sports. Uh, there has been a scheduling issue with that, so we have had to kind of push him off. Uh, so we will find somebody for Money in the Bank uh, for, for next week. I'm still working on that, so I do apologize for the false advertising. Also, check out my pinned tweet, guys. Check out my pinned tweet. Still plenty of time. You can register to win tickets to SummerSlam in Nashville. It's all right there. If you're subscribed to the Believe in Pro Wrestling YouTube channel, all you got to do is retweet my pinned tweet and you're registered. Boom, ready to go. You get to Nashville. We'll get you in the door uh, for SummerSlam slam and you can watch roman reigns versus brock lesnar yeah god damn it i just want to like enjoy wrestling you know i just want to be happy this has not been a good week for like feeling good about professional wrestling as a whole honestly it just hasn't been this is not the type of show that i enjoy doing i don't they, like screaming they, into a microphone they told us True Hill He 180 was the most depressing and heaviest episode that we've ever done. So I understand. Oh. Appreciate y'all. Hopefully brighter, brighter days are ahead. We got a Monday Night Raw tonight. We're getting Becky Lynch and Asuka. That's, that's a match they love to put on as much as Roman Reigns and, and Brock Lesnar, but they always deliver. We'll see who qualifies for Money in the Bank. Real quick, who do you think is actually going to qualify? Becky Lynch or Asuka tonight? Uh, I think Becky's going to qualify tonight, but they're both going to be in the match. Probably, because that's what WWE does. They do things that don't make sense. I think AJ Styles is going to end up eventually in Money in the Bank as well. They'll probably do one of those, oh, all three of you losers are now going to wrestle for the you know second chance qualify. They'll do something like that. That's Oh, who knows? We might get Becky and Asuka fight to a, a double DQ or a double countout like they did with Sheamus and, and Drew McIntyre, and then we'll take a week, and, and then I'll Adam Pear, Pierce will come back and say, hey, you're both in. Again, rhetorical, rhetorical for many reasons. Thank you for listening to the Believe in Pro Wrestling podcast brought to you by Ben Online. Enjoy your Monday.